same time, that story some of the American who was arrested in Congo. Um, American says, um, rode a scooter down the Spanish steps and damaged it. It was like $27,000 in the or something. So, yeah, I don't think they put them in jail, but they definitely did. Wow. So we don't have to do anything with the street, do we? Correct. You know what? I think we ask at the end. I don't want to get into too much interaction. I want the thing to flow initially. Okay. So let's ask it at the end, because otherwise it may be hard to get back. Okay. And, and that way we can also talk a little bit about the future of the So is, is Darren already gone? Is he Yeah, Melinda and I have, um, are doing a hands-on history open house in the archives, um, and so we've got tons of stuff laid out, and then the class of 1970 is having their lounge in the area just outside the archives, and Don pulled together a bunch of um, video from that era, including their marches on the work coverage, so we've got those ready for them, and then Melinda's doing an LGBT presentation for LGBT alumni in the back part of the archives tomorrow afternoon, I think at like 3 or 3 30. So. Well, Ray Jones is helping me on the class of 70. And Bill Kennedy, um, I've got two dates. And he's only going to be here, so he went out and he had one. He came back and he only would get stuff, so he fixed that up and said, let's take a picture. I think he'll do something like that. That happens all the time. It happens a lot with service people. Enter with one class and finish with another. Yeah, exactly. A lot had to do that. And Ray was a senior when he was not a white man. Uh, was the first year. They, they rode back and forth again when they were in Oh. And uh, that's what it is. Right there. All the beginning of freshman year. <laughs> all that time in the car. Exactly. shooting for other spaces that were a little bit more accessible, but who knew we would be so popular? Right, right. You know, yeah. They only moved us in here because of the numbers, and, you know, we wouldn't have fit in Stafford over in the rector building. I think their capacity is only maybe 50 or 60. So we may want to, once you do the problems, but we may want to try to cut short, so I'll try to keep running short. Uh, we can go until 4.30, the guy said that's what he has in his guy in the But I think we ought to try and stop by telephone for questions. Yeah, yeah. and questions uh, could go on a lot. Because yeah, exactly. it all depends on what people have read and heard and seen. Right. And we can get a lot of questions. his first experience of doing the whole alumni weekend thing, where you have to be everywhere at once, exactly. and everybody wants to talk to you. Although he's been talking at least with folks for a while.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for coming. It's great to see you all. And also welcome to those who are tuning in online. So we're, we're delighted to be able to give this presentation uh, today on the Carlisle Indian School. I'm Susan Rose, Professor of Sociology and Director of the Mosaics and Co-Director of the Carlisle Indian School Digital Resource Center with my colleague. Oh, and class of 77 and parent of 13. And I don't always announce this, but both of my parents are also Dickinson alums. <laughs> class, of <laughs> class of 44 and 45. <laughs> and I'm Jim Gorenzer, uh, class of 93. I'm the college archivist and co-director of the Carlisle Indian School Digital Resource Center. And I am not a legacy, so <laughs> just me. <laughs> And more than enough. So we also want to acknowledge that Dickinson is on the unceded lands of the Susquehannock Nation and acknowledge that many indigenous peoples lived here well before Dickinson was founded. And also many indigenous children from all over the country, including Alaska and Puerto Rico and Hawaii, were brought to the Carlisle Indian School um, from 1879 to 1918. So we want to talk a little bit about the Carlisle Indian School, the history of it, and also tell the story of three of the more than 8,000 children who were enrolled at Carlisle. Um, and we're going to make that introduction through a trailer of a documentary that a former student, now an alum, Manuel Serhalehi and I produced with the Lipan Apache Band of Texas. So two children, Jack and Cassetta, were captured in a massacre uh, of their village along the Texas-Mexican border in 1877, known as the Day of Screams. Everyone in the village was massacred, but there were a few men who were out on a small game hunting expedition. And when they came back, they couldn't find these two children. And in fact, the family didn't know for 132 years what happened to them. The research going on back east, both with further east than Dickinson, so the University of East Anglia with our colleague Jackie Fierce Siegel, uh, and also research here at the Cumberland County Historical Society and faculty and Jim, um, been very involved in this process. We're able to locate various photos and match some of the names in the photos of those two children uh, who were sent to Carlisle in 1880 uh, and then we welcomed the Lipan Apache band who wanted to do the blessing ceremonies so these three children could be sent on. Jack was about 10 when he was captured. He died at 14 from tuberculosis. And Cassetta was about 13. And she ended up being the longest enrolled student at Carlisle. And upon her death, she was actually still named a prisoner of war. She had a son, Dick Cassetta, um, and when she died, he was about three, almost four, and so he was sent back to the Carlisle Indian School. She had been on outing as a domestic servant and nanny to families in the Philadelphia area. So Dick Casita was sent back um, at age four and was the youngest child to be enrolled at Carlisle. So we're going to first show this documentary. It's about 18 minutes. And then Jim is also going to introduce the Carlisle Indian School Digital Resource Center, which is really uh, making the names and the records of the students and the Carlisle Indian School freely and easily accessible to nations, native nations across the country. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Right before we start the documentary, you can see here, uh, Carlisle is number one, the first federally off-reservation, first federally funded off-reservation boarding school in the country. And Richard Henry Pratt, who started the school, was quite clear about wanting to bring children far from far away to sever the relationships with their family, their communities, their language and customs. Um, and he really thought that by assimilating them to the white man's ways, he would solve the Indian problem. And argued that it was actually much cheaper to educate the children what some now see as a form of genocide, um, than to continue the military 
uh, expeditions. So uh, the first children also brought were from the Dakotas, from Pine Ridge Sioux and the Rosebud uh, Reservation. Uh, again, those were seen as some of the more problematic tribes at the time, and so there was, those were the first children uh, to be brought to Carlisle. So I think right now we'll go ahead and show the documentary trailer. It's also on YouTube. It's a very emotional thing for my people. A lot of our people won't talk about it. it it's really scarred our families for three, going on four generations now. And every time someone would speak up and say something about it, it was always said, leave it alone. One day someone's gonna come and show us where our little ones are at. So Cassetta's story was obviously being slowly pieced together here in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. But meanwhile, in Texas, it had never been forgotten. And every year, the Lipan Apache memorialized all the lost ones from Rimolino and other massacres. And included in that are, of course, Jack and Cassetta, whose names are not mentioned. They are the lost ones. These two children are Lipan Apache living on the Texas-Mexican border with their family, with their band, and at, this is the time when there's massive expansion of the white population into this whole region, and so there's a whole series of forts built by the US Army to protect the settlers. When the Lipan Apache were raiding across the border and often withdrawing to the Mexican side, Ulysses S. Grant gave Randall McKenzie permission to go across the border, to ignore the Texas-Mexican border, to make raids on these Lipan Apaches. And the most memorable one was when Randall McKenzie went across the border and essentially massacred a whole band when the um, warriors were away, and so it was basically women and children. And this is known as the Day of Screams. And the children are actually hidden by their mother in some bushes where they're found by the soldiers who think that they're the only survivors. And the children are then taken in by the family of one of the bandsmen in the 4th Cavalry. And for three years, they travel around with that family. So they never return to their own families and they never see their own people again. But they are semi-adopted by the Smith family, Charles and Molly Smith. And we know that from a surviving photograph, which is the beginning of the piecing together of the special story of these two children. Because in 1991, Celeste Sorgio, the granddaughter of Charles and Molly Smith, Celeste Sorgio wrote to the Cumberland County Historical Society and sent a photograph of the two children, who at that time were called Cassetta and Jack Smith. And it shows the children in their Sunday best, and it's dated March 1880. And that photograph 
was perhaps taken as the last memorial for these children before they were forcibly removed and sent to the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. Written on the back of this photo is, it says, um, Cassetta and Jack Smith. And then it says underneath um, that they called Molly my wife, and it's obviously written by Charles, Mama. So it sounds as if they had found um, some kind of a home with this white couple. They moved to the Carlisle Indian School. Cassetta is a little bit older than Jack. He's a, she's about 13, and Jack is about 10. The photograph taken at Carlisle is more difficult to date, but it's a very similar time period because the children look almost the same age. So we can match the two photographs and say, these are the same children. These are the children that left Kansas and came to Pennsylvania. When the Carlisle Indian School was founded in 1879, the very first groups of children to come came from the Rosebud Sioux and Pine Ridge Sioux reservations. And then other Plains groups came in. Uh, this was in October of 1879. By the time the school closed in 1918, there were over 10,000 children who came through uh, the Carlisle community and lived at the Indian school. Children were typically enrolled for a period of three to five years. Oftentimes they would re-enroll. And you know, if you look, if you look at this sea of children behind me, I mean, these children came from virtually every nation. So if you imagine a map of the United States and parts of Canada and Puerto Rico and just span across that map, starting with Alaska natives and mission children from California, Blackfeet from Montana, Crow, Assiniboine, Hidatsa, Mandan, Chippewa. You had Anishinaabe kids from um, Michigan, uh, Midwestern states. You had Six Nations kids from New York State, Mohawk, Cayuga, Oneida, Seneca, um, Tuscarora. You had Abenaki from Maine. So, you know, just imagine all of the 550 federally recognized tribes. They all were represented at Carlisle during that era. So the very first groups of children to come didn't speak English at all. And the purpose of the school was to assimilate them to try to get them swallowed up. You know, there were these very violent metaphors that Richard Henry Pratt, the founder, used to describe this process. Um, he, he used the um, analogy of Christian baptism. He said, we like to take these children and hold them under until they're thoroughly soaked. And when, when they come out, they will be so-called civilized. So that was the goal to take these children who came from almost uh, hundreds of different cultures, language groups, spiritual ways, and, and change them, transform them into carbon copies of their European American brothers and sisters. The clothing is removed. Some of it goes down to the Smithsonian, some of it is, um, just disappears. The hair is cut. And, of course, because the children are inside and also because the lighting of the camera is used very skillfully, the children look much paler, much whiter in the after pictures. So you can see before your very eyes the civilizing process visually translated in these portraits. There are no pictures of what Cassetta would have looked like in her Lipan Apache dress because she had already been with the Smith family for three years and the same for Jack, but of course there are students who arrived straight from the reservation and who had been dressed in their very best clothing and who were wearing all their regalia, full regalia when they arrived, as a kind of honour for their leaving and who then of course had photographs taken in their school uniform, so the contrast is dramatic. Cassetta is, for the Carlisle Indian School, almost the ideal student in many ways because she's totally deracinated. They wanted to break the, cult the contact with the traditional culture. Cassetta comes with that 
break already made. And so she's included in a lot of the photographs that are taken, and she's also one of the many children that are featured in a postcard. It's a photograph that's turned into a postcard which is entitled Our Boys and Girls. It's part of a commercial series that's sold by the school where the, the heads of the children who have had their portraits taken in their school uniform are placed on a single postcard or um, slide that's then sold. So she is one of our boys and girls. She's very much at the forefront in the early days of the school because she arrives 1880 and the school's only been running for a year. Cassetta, Cassetta was in, had wounds on the front and back of her shoulder and the side of her neck. And when they asked how they got them, how she got them, she told the story that her mother had tried to kill her in order to keep her from the American soldiers. And this, of course, is interpreted as an act of savagery by the Carlisle School rather than an act of desperation by a mother trying to protect her daughter. Cassetta would have lost her family when she was around 10, so prepubescent. But when she came to Carlisle at around 13, she would have been exactly the age when she would have had a very important ceremony for her, the Apache puberty ceremony, where she would have been honoured as a woman and the wisdom of women would have been given to her and shared with her and she would have taken her place in the family as a Lipan Apache woman with all that knowledge. But instead, instead of the beautiful um, garments that she would have worn for that ceremony, instead Cassetta is put in the school uniform and she learns to march and she learns to drill and she learns to read and write rather than the traditional wisdom that might have been hers. Um, after Cressetta passed away, this little boy ended up in the Carlisle community and, and literally was the baby of the school. On his application form, it's listed that he is tribe Lipan Apache. So here is the child of Cassetta, who is supposed to have had all Indianness eradicated from her, who is now being given a tribal affiliation of a group he's never met. And he's actually not even going to quite remember who he is or know who he is later on. So he's sent to the Carlisle Indian School, much younger than any of the other students. By this time, Carlisle is taking students off the reservation who've been through the schooling system, so a higher um, level in the school and are older. So he sticks out as very unusual. He became like the mascot. He was the mascot at school when he was arrived because he was the baby. There were no other Indian children who were four years old, so he was already called the Carlisle baby. There is a big silence about what has happened because of the pain and because of the um, extraordinary dis cultural and psychological disruption it's caused. So some of the communities carry these stories, others there's been a huge silence and it's the grandchildren of the students who are returning to find out about their grandparents. One of the most remarkable things for me as I was dealing with the written record and the photographic record was learning that there's this other record that's carried on through four generations that carries this story down the generations and doesn't allow, allow it to die. We have to tell the story from the other side. The other side being the spiritual world, being the world that most people call heaven, the other, you know, we reach into that world to tell our story to bring it back. Our people cannot move forward until our lost ones are sent home. And then I said, and we'll pray and we'll do certain prayers that I'm going to do. And then the final act will be to spread the ash and to lay rock and walk away. Then from that point on, I give prayer maybe. And my prayer is going to be that come tomorrow on the anniversary of you being taken from your people and from our people and from our families, that we ask the Creator to open the door and let her in to sit down. In August every year, our families have always met. And uh, we've always set an empty plate out. And, and that's so we won't forget this year's family reunion will be, we won't put the plate out no more.
there's something living and you walk away, you leave something, something that has passed on, something you leave and return to something living so that the spirit doesn't get mad when you leave. When you turn your back to it, you don't look back because it keeps, uh, it doesn't, you don't, you're not enticing that spirit to come follow you. You're telling him, we spare you, you're now gone, but when we're in return for our sadness, we give you something green that you may grow and you may bring yourself into that life. So uh, we thought we'd take a few questions first uh, about the documentary, either the making of it uh, or these children, and then we'll introduce the Digital Resource Center. So does anyone have questions? Yes. Yeah, they're right next to each other. Yeah, Pine Ridge is the one right by the number 24 there. Yes. I'm just curious to know how old this guy that was listening for that and knowing his family. I make the assumption he was quite young. His grandfather was a child. He had a child quite young. And I doubt that he was a man who would have come from the tribe. Right. Uh, actually, she was 39 um, when she died, also of tuberculosis. Um, on the birth certificate, it does have a white father. And um, having done a lot of work on gender violence, that was one of my first thoughts. And I think Barb Landis also, who's in this. We actually don't know whether there was sexual abuse, whether it was an outing father or brother. Um, it may well be, it could have been consensual, um, although then probably if it was a consensual, she might have named the person. So we actually don't know the situation. 
in terms of that. Um, we certainly do know there was abuse um, at the various Indian schools. Um, so that's, that's a very reasonable uh, assumption or question, yeah. Yes? Um, Jack, do you want to answer this? Because he's really looked at a lot of the files on the death certificates. Yeah, um, so tuberculosis was um, the leading killer in the country of everybody at that time because um, there was no good treatment for it. Um, they, the idea was that students were supposed to have a physical before coming to Carlisle or going to any of the schools because they didn't want to be bringing illnesses in. Um, but the doctors who worked on the reservations often were not being as careful. Um, but as a general rule, tuberculosis and pneumonia um, were among the largest uh, killers of, of students at the school. Both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We do know um, Jack uh, did not have tuberculosis before he came to the school, but was sent down to Fort Marion in St. Augustine. Uh, one of the, the women who recruited uh, students actually worked with Pratt, and she semi-adopted Jack. Um, so we have a sense that he contacted tuberculosis there, and when he became sick, was sent back to the Carlisle Indian School. Yes? <laughs> right. Well, in fact, that's why we show the map, which has now gone out of presentation mode. So let me put that back up. Um, because it was far east, uh, it was also close to D.C. So for uh, fundraising purposes and PR, that was useful. It was also at that point uh, not being used as a military barracks. Um, so the barracks were there. Um, and the irony is Pratt talked about this being an ideal location because the community didn't harbor any uh, prejudice against the Indians. Now, he'd also helped train the cavalry officers who fought in the Indian Wars, and of course we know people uh, were dislocated um, from this area. In fact, there's no federally recognized tribe in Pennsylvania today. So that's part of the reason, and the other reason was he really wanted to take the children far away from their homes. Um, so that was really part of the plan. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are there any uh, buildings that are still in existence in Carlisle? Mm -hmm. Do you want to? Yeah, there's um, about half a dozen to a dozen buildings on the Carlisle barracks that date back to the time of the school. Uh, the barracks itself had been almost entirely burned to the ground during the Civil War because the Confederates had invaded the town of Carlisle and destroyed the barracks. And they were rebuilt in uh, 1868, um, but a lot of those buildings were inadequate for the school. So over the years of operation of the school, they rebuilt a lot of buildings or made major renovations to them. Um, but throughout the 20th century, then many of those buildings were demolished. But there are a number of them that do still date from that period. Yeah. Um, can you just tell us uh, about the Indian tribes, some of whom numbers of them were lost? Were, for instance, did you get in the Carlisle Indian School any Anishabi folks from the Great Lakes region as the Great Lakes Indian School? There, as uh, Barb Landis mentioned in the video, there were um, students coming from every tribe in the United States. Um, there were no students coming that were known to be from a Canadian tribe, but some of those tribes, like the Mohawk, St. Regis Mohawk up and around Hogansburg, um, that border was somewhat porous, so there may have been students from also those portions of the Midwest that would cross the borders, but um, they were recruited from the Indian reservations on the American side. Mm -hmm. Did you define recruited for us, please? Sure. So, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so when Richard Henry Pratt made his visit to Pine Ridge and Rosebud in 1879, um, basically, he had been told by the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, who had been told by the Secretary of the Interior, 
um, we want you to talk to the chiefs and convince them that they should send their children and the other, their, own, their very own children as well as children of their tribe to Carlisle and convince them that this is the best thing for them. Um, so those earliest students coming to Carlisle was typically that kind of negotiation with government officials. And actually the Secretary of the Interior had been at Rosebud and Pine Ridge uh, about a month before Richard Henry Pratt arrived. So he was already priming the pump for this. And um, Richard Henry Pratt used some of the former uh, prisoners of war from uh, from Florida that he had himself trained earlier, he sent them to what was Indian Territory, Oklahoma today, to recruit from the Kiowa, the Comanche, the Cheyenne, and Arapaho as well. So in the earliest years of Carlisle and the other uh, off-reservation boarding schools, that is how students were brought to Carlisle, is there was basically a negotiation among the chiefs uh, and elders in those tribes to convince them to send their children away. As the, as the system, because it was a government-wide system, as the system became uh, better established and, and more entrenched, um, then uh, it became mandatory that if you were a Native American living on a reservation, you were forced to send your child to some school and then there was basically an application form and you were choosing which of the schools you might want to send your children to. So by the 1890s, we start to see application forms for students coming to Carlisle. And, and some of the negotiation was that uh, if their children learned English, they would be better able to negotiate treaties. So it's to the advantage of some of the chiefs. Um, and there certainly was coercion in some places, the agents, you know, got certain benefits and pay if they recruited certain children. And then particularly in the later years, there were some who voluntarily came. We have some letters of students who had been at Carlisle who then wanted to have their students enrolled. Um, so there are a lot of really sad and tragic stories. Um, and there are also some who would say that they actually got a good education. Um, so we're beginning to look, I think, as, as more and more research has been done, some of the greater nuances um, in terms of this. But recruitment, that was a great question. <laughs> there were many ways, uh, some coerced and some more voluntary. Do you know what percentage? We know about 1,000 ran away. Yeah. Um, so that level of detail is something that we're starting to look into. Um, so we'll come back to that, but it's, there's a lot of research to be done now that we have easy access to a lot more documentation. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the students did return to their home communities. Uh, whereas Pratt's idea was you should never go home, you should essentially permanently break all ties and you should move to the city and get a job and you know just completely become a part of mainstream society. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the Carlisle students returned to their home communities and many of them uh, became leaders within those communities themselves and interestingly they became advocates for um, keeping their tribal traditions alive. Um, so in the, in the video, you see the image of Tom Torlino, which is one of the most iconic before and after pairings. Well, Tom Torlino, when he went back to uh, his Navajo homelands, uh, he became a religious leader for his traditional native religion. He was not um, abandoning his tribal ways. So, um, so that was popular to go home even though also some of the, the publications that were heavily uh, censored and edited uh, by the administrators um, talked about the Indians not going back to the blanket. Uh, that's something Pratt didn't want to have happen. And so you'd have some of the stories, again, uh, not always written by the students themselves, but by others posing as a student, uh, talking about you know not having gone back to the Indian ways. Um, but as Jim has said, uh, the majority did return. Dick Casita, the little, the baby of the Carlisle Indian School, he's one of the few who actually stayed in Carlisle. I think one of two, George Uta being the other. 
Um, so he actually stayed uh, in Carlisle, married a woman uh, who was from a farming family. Uh, they never had children, um, but they inherited the Bel Air Park, uh, amusement park. It was a big spot in the 1920s and 30s in Carlisle, where people would either bring uh, Hiawatha's boat up to the Hiawatha launching up the Cana de Gwinnett, or drive their Fords in. Um, so he inherited that property, um, though at times would pose as the Indian, would actually wear Plains Indian headdress, um, and he was known as the Indian. Um, that happens to be the place that we bought <laughs> from his widow. So we actually are on the land uh, where Dick Casita uh, actually spent his last years. And that, and, and I'll just mention that briefly. It was dark in the beginning, and part of that was the lighting, but part of that was also, this is a, whoops, a Dickinson story. Uh, so Manu Serlehi, who helped me with this film, was graduating, and his parents had come from Argentina and were staying with us. And Diane Lazar's parents also came from France and Morocco. And we were having a dinner um, when um, Daniel Castro Romero showed up. He was supposed to come a couple days earlier, but they were at the UN working on the platform for indigenous peoples. And so he arrived um, as we were actually finishing dinner on our porch. So that's actually filmed on our porch. We didn't have lights. <laughs> I said, Mono, grab the camera. Um, and we didn't want to interrupt the flow of his telling of the story and the oral history. I mean, this was sort of a sacred moment. And the other amazing thing was that they actually wanted this documented. And part of that was they were looking for federal recognition. Um, but typically, we would not bring out a camera um, at that point. But they had requested, actually, that we do the filming. And all of the music, um, all of the photos of the puberty ceremony, those are all from the Lipan Apache that they provided all of that, um, and then also wanted the trailer on YouTube. And the only thing we've done to alter that is remove the Lipan Apache words. Um, so it's just in English um, that one is hearing what he's saying in that, that longer version. But that's in part why it was so dark, and it was also amazing because it was literally on the anniversary of the Day of Screams, um, which was May 17th, which was the same day, actually the 18th, the next day they were graduating. Yes? Mm -hmm. So the reason that number two is in Oregon, so Pratt didn't have a brand new idea. So Carlisle is the first off-reservation boarding school. There were already a lot of other boarding schools that were on reservations. Some of them were run by uh, religious organizations. Some of them were run by the... Uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs. So Pratt's idea of moving the school further away from Native communities was his one sort of innovation. But there was another army officer who had the same idea around the same time and had started petitioning also in 1879 to open a school uh, up in the Northwest. And so that uh, is around Salem, Oregon, and the school became known as Chamawa. Um, so, um, I think it was called Forest Park when they first opened it, and I can't remember that officer's name, but, but that idea of needing to separate young people from their families as a way to more easily assimilate them, that idea was already there um, as early as the 1860s. You saw teachers at uh, Indian schools talking about how difficult it is um, to teach them because what they learn during the day, then they go home at night and, you know, they're right back in the same environment where um, they feel that they're going to backslide, if you will. Uh, so this idea of separation was already out there and being talked about for uh, well over a decade. Uh, and so with Pratt, it was the extreme separation of being literally more than a thousand miles away 
um, whereas the off-reservation boarding school in Oregon is off the reservation, but there's still a lot of tribal communities relatively close. Um, so that's, uh, but all of those, those two dozen other schools are all opened within about a decade. So the idea is one that, you know, took hold immediately because people were already open to that concept of the off-reservation boarding school. And David Wallace Adams uh, has written one of the seminal works, I mean, a classic work called Education for Extinction. Um, so if you're interested, that would be uh, one book you might want to take a look at. Yeah, um, that uh, just issued, I think, in 2020, a 25th anniversary second updated expanded edition of uh, the David Wallace Adams work. Um, I don't know nearly as much of the Jim Thorpe story. Barb Landis should be here for that. She, she has met and talked with many of Jim Thorpe's descendants and been at uh, family events for the Thorpes. Um, but he uh, entered Carlisle around 1904, and it's uh, somewhat difficult to separate the, the myths from the reality, I mean, the, the, you know, the one great story is that he was working on the farm. So where the Carlisle Indian School was located on the Carlisle Barracks, there were several um, farms, you know, 40 acres here, 50 acres there, that were immediately adjacent. And uh, Pratt would lease that land from the local farmers to teach agriculture. And uh, so Thorpe was on one of those farms and they would ring the dinner bell and supposedly he came running uh, from the farm and you know was leaping and the athletic field was right there so you have to come through the athletic field so Pop Warner is out there with his uh, you know practicing with his team and he sees Thorpe tear across there and you know he says get that boy a uniform you know <laughs> it's, it's a great story whether or not it's true is another thing um, but, but Thorpe clearly had amazing uh, talent, uh, very effortless. Uh, apparently, he could take up any sport and, and be masterful at it. He was just all around amazing athlete. And so uh, Thorpe and others in that era, um, the athletes certainly got perks. Uh, also at uh, the school. So there would be talk about uh, Pop Warner would keep a, a cooler of beers on his front porch and you know the athletes could just stop by. Um, and in Thorpe's years they developed a separate dormitory just for the athletes and they were getting different food than the students were getting in the dining hall. So um, but uh, yeah, he, he was literally a legend in his own time, but Barb Landis would be able to tell you a lot more stories. Uh, he's Sack and Fox. Yeah. Yes. And his brother also attended uh, Carlisle. Um, one of the other perks, again, of being Jim Thorpe. So. Uh, so then Thorpe married here in town. He was married at uh, St. Patrick's uh, Church. And uh, then he and his wife, uh, while he was playing professional baseball, they um, lived, now I can't remember if he played for the Giants. I think he was playing for the Giants in New York. And so his brother, Edward, went on outing well, basically, he lived with his sister-in-law in New York because he was keeping her company while Thorpe was, you know, touring around the country with a baseball team. So Edward Thorpe's outing wasn't nearly the hard labor that other students might have experienced working on farms. And we might want to just uh, clarify, too, the outing program was one of uh, Pratt's sort of inventions where he wanted them working in the summer uh, for white families in the area. So for a lot of the girls, they would be nannies, domestic servants. The boys might be doing farm work. Some worked at uh, Ford uh, or Hershey. So, um, and actually some spent the whole year in public schools living with white families. So the outing program was also uh, an important part of his mission. Yeah, Wendy. Yeah, 
Yeah, I'm gonna let Jim first talk about the work study, and, and maybe that's a good segue. Hold that for just a second, and that's the segue that we'll make, and there's a lot we can talk about. Also, the Indigeneity Futures initiative that's going on, so there's a lot happening now. We have our first uh, tenure-track Native scholar, uh, Darren Lone Fight. Um, so this is a curriculum that's gonna continue to be built. Hold that one second, because I wanna get this gentleman here We don't, actually. We have that letter, but um, there was no way of uh, gaining contact with the family themselves. Um, so I, know, I do know they were riding from fort to fort. They weren't always set in Kansas, so it may well have been that it was seen as inappropriate that the children would continue to be moving with the cavalry, and when the school opened, sent them, but we actually don't have any historical evidence about that. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what our project is doing and then we can get yeah, back to other, other questions. Um, so with the Carlisle Indian School Digital Resource Center, because of the amount of interest in the history of the school, uh, Barbara Landis, who we've mentioned several times at the Cumberland County Historical Society, she had been personally uh, meeting with living descendants and helping them research their family's experience using records that are at the Cumberland County Historical Society, particularly a large collection of uh, the newspapers that were printed at the school. The school had a printing press and, and teaching uh, typesetting and, and printing was one of the other trades that they taught. So uh, Barb had that experience and um, Dickinson had a smattering of materials related to the Indian School. I did not know about the Carlisle Indian School before I became the archivist here and started working here at Dickinson. And so as I learned more about the school and learned about the interest in um, knowing more about the school, I had this idea that it would be a lot easier for researchers if information could be made accessible online. We had had experience digitizing collections from Dickinson's own archives, um, so I wanted to take that experience and work with the Cumberland County Historical Society to start to make their information uh, more easily accessible so that people wouldn't have to travel from all parts of the country here to Carlisle to do that work. And as I discussed this idea with Susan, um, then, Dickinson College received a grant from the Mellon Foundation to support work in the digital humanities. And so that was the, the grant that really helped to get this effort started. And we decided that the most important thing was to digitize the original records from the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C., because that was the true administrative documentation maintained at the school. So the very first records that we were digitizing were uh, the records of the students themselves. These would have been the administrative files kept at the Historical Society. And so we were sending uh, Dickinson College undergraduates down to the National Archives uh, with laptops and small scanners like you'd get at Staples, and they would spend all day just scanning page after page after page. And they would do that uh, typically for a two-week stint and then they would come back to Dickinson and they would process all of that raw information. So all of their raw scans, they would be using Photoshop to um, cr create these PDF files and then they'd be uploading those files and adding all of these details so that you could uh, follow the records and see what connections there might be made uh, from different files and different records. So uh, that started in the summer of 2013. That was when we sent our first team down there. And so we could typically digitize about 20,000 pages each time we made a trip, um, about four, four students in a typical two-week period. And so now we've digitized about 300,000 pages of material altogether through about a dozen visits to the National Archives and material at the Historical Society. And what we've been able to do is for the first time ever compile 
an accurate list of every student who is known to have gone to Carlisle. There are, um, there are ledgers of uh, the admission of each of the students that they have at the National Archives. And so these pages, each one of these lines has detail about uh, parents' names, whether their parents are alive or dead, um, age, weight, height, things of that nature. Um, there's information about their outings. There's information about um, the comings and goings of the students. These daily morning reports are basically giving us all of that kind of detail. There are death ledgers for the students who die at the school of tuberculosis and other causes. Um, so all of this information was largely hidden from researchers. There had only been one uh, scholar who had tried to pour through these records and she wrote her dissertation in the late 1990s. Um, but no one else had really been able to penetrate this detail and now it's easily searchable and uh, we have gotten emails from people all over the country thanking us for making this information about their ancestors more easily accessible to them. Um, the Historical Society also has a huge collection of photographs and uh, again these photographs were largely unknown and so being able to share these and again make them fully searchable so that uh, people can see their, their ancestors uh, through these photographs and request copies that we can provide for them. Um, I remember one of the, the first times I got one of those emails that, you know, you get a lump in your throat. Someone uh, had emailed and uh, found her, uh, the file for her great-grandmother, and she said she had never seen her great-grandmother's handwriting before because she had written a letter back to the school. One of the things that the school did, um, you know, which we've sort of hinted at, there was a lot of propaganda to promote the school, to keep uh, the Carlisle message out there. So Carlisle uh, would send basically alumni surveys to the former students and ask them, are you married? Where do you live now? Um, do you have a nice house? If you have a nice house, could you send us a picture? Because then we'll put that in the magazine and show people what the successful life of a Carlisle graduate looks like. Um, they'd even ask them, I mean, very invasive questions. How much money do you have in the bank? Um, if you have a farm, you know, how many head of cattle do you have? Things like that. Um, so they're trying to use that information to then talk about, see what a wonderful job we're doing. They're trying to use that as evidence for why the school needs continued support. Um, Pratt was really a master of propaganda. And um, so from the day that Carlisle started, you would see Carlisle Indian School appearing in the newspapers all the time. Um, they started a marching band. The marching band appeared at the opening of the Brooklyn Bridge. That's not an accident. The marching band appears at parades for the inauguration of US presidents. Um, you know, there, there's a huge exhibit for the Carlisle Indian School at the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Um, if you're looking in Harper's Magazine, Frank Leslie's Illustrated, um, all kinds of other newspapers, Carlisle's in there all the time. And once the football program gets started, um, then it's just another added dimension of why Carlisle is world famous, really. The, the band goes on a European tour at one point. So uh, the band would also go to um, Long Beach, uh, New Jersey, and basically have months where they would be uh, just doing three shows a day. Uh, at the beach. So, so Carlisle is on everybody's lips in the country. They hear about Carlisle all the time. And now um, this documentation makes it even easier to see how all those pieces connect. And so we can look at a student record, see where a student went on outing. We can go to the outing ledgers to confirm where exactly they were. We can find that house on Google Maps now because the addresses are there. Um, it's really amazing the level of detail we can find out about the students. Um, 
And so what this means now, um, you know, we can find those individual documents, but those kinds of questions like how many students did this, how many students had this kind of experience. Uh, we've done a little experimenting with mapping the outings. Um, so how many students went to this community, how many students went to that community, and we can start to map that using GIS software and sort of see where were the centers where students were sent most often. Um, we had a student this past year who just volunteered his time. He was a first year student who had some experience with GIS and he started looking at where the students were coming from. So mapping out, okay, in 1881, where are the, co the native communities that students are coming from? 1882, where are the different communities that they're coming from in that year? So there's a lot of potential here to now really start to aggregate this information. Um, just as an example of something I've been working on on my own in my free time, um, this is what I do at evening and my evenings when I'm at home as I'm scouring these records. Um, we're trying to, so there's always this question, how old are the, are the children when they come to Carlisle? How many of them are um, over 18? Because there are, I mean, it's a very, it's not school like we think of it today where it's very regimented in terms of the age that people arrive and all of that. So I've been tracking age information as well as how long students are there because some students are there for a couple of days, some students are there for many, many years, um, it all depends. So just in counting, so I should also mention, we know now there's about 7,800 students. Um, so in the video, you heard that it was uh, more than 10,000, uh, but that was always because Barb and other researchers um, were thinking there were additional gaps in the records, and so they didn't totally understand how the ledger books and these documents and everything all work together, but we've been able to corroborate all those pieces. And she also mentioned students that would re-enter. So to some researchers, that would look like two different people, but it was really one student coming in 1785, being there for five years and leaving for a few months, but then re-enrolling and spending another three years at Carlisle. So we've been able to suss all that out. Um, so I have so far gotten up as far as 1896, so basically the first uh, uh, 17 years of the school, and there were 2,900 different students who arrived in that time. And I did some quick uh, numbers uh, before coming. So 4% of the students were um, 20 years of age or older uh, when they enrolled. 41% were between 16 and 20, 45% were between 12 and 15, and 10% of the students were 11 or younger. So that gives you a good sense that students for the most part are teenagers. I mean, that, there, there is a bit of a bell curve with uh, enrollment at Carlisle. Um, in the, of that same group of 2,900 students, 125 married couples came out. So that's one thing that's often talked about is the, the pan-Indian movement grows out of Carlisle and other boarding schools because traditionally tribes would not have had much interaction outside their communities. But by bringing together um, people from native communities across the country, they started to see their commonalities um, and the pan-Indian movement that develops in the 19-teens and 20s grows out of that because now you have people, uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho from Oklahoma, talking to the, the Chippewa in, uh, in Minnesota, for instance. So, um, and yeah, the number of married couples that come out of the school, um, people have talked about finding their spouses at Carlisle. Um, of that group, uh, 28, um, students of that era then were parents and sent their own children to Carlisle in later years. In that same time period, there's 150 deaths at the school. So uh, over those 17 years, uh, 150 deaths among the students. That, that's about nine students per year on average. So those 
all of that kind of data is the kind of thing we're just beginning to be able to collect that and mine that information. Yeah. There are. Um, there's a lot. I mean, the, the simple fact of the matter is there's, there's a number of Carlisle students who then go back and recruit to bring people from their own tribe to Carlisle. Um, there are many people who see this as a positive. I mean, when in, in looking back, we see it as a form of genocide, attempt to completely erase their cultures. But they didn't necessarily think of it that way because they were going back to their communities and they were looking for ways to keep their traditional cultures alive. So they were trying to navigate a really horrible system. I mean, I, I always try to stress that this is a system that's been imposed on all of them. So the entire reservation system is a means of forcing them to live on this space of land, right? That we're gonna tell you, you have to live here. Now we're gonna tell you, you have to eat these rations that we're providing. You have to learn to farm the way we farm. You have, you know, you have to do this, you have to do that. Um, some of the people who came to Carlisle, they were prisoners of war, as we've talked about. Um, so going to Carlisle might actually seem like a better alternative than being stuck in a prisoner of war camp where people might be dying of uh, dysentery and cholera. Um, other people, um, this is a very unusual case, but I often use it as an example as there are 7,800 different stories. It's really hard to categorize. But when we were uh, in Idaho visiting the Nez Perce Reservation, there was a memoir written by a student who uh, around 1890, he heard about Carlisle from other former students who had returned to the community. He heard good things. He had been orphaned. He was living with his aunt and uncle. And from his description, he was not being treated well living with his extended family. So he ran away to go to Carlisle. And he found an older woman who would pretend to be his grandmother and sign the consent form so that he could go to Carlisle. Now, that's highly unusual. But again, it's an example of how different the circumstances are for each different native community across the country and each individual person. Um, so it is important. We've also been doing a lot of visits uh, across the country with various native communities, and it's often uh, very, very sensitive, very tricky. Um, so for many Native Americans, contemporary Native Americans, they do see it as genocide, and at the same time, and you can see the tension at times in the group of some saying, you know, it was good old Carlisle, uh, you know, my grandpa got a really good education. Um, and as Jim was talking about, the reservation system where a lot of people are living in poverty, sometimes it was better for parents to send their children. Um, but I think our experience, I would say, across most of the groups that we have visited uh, is seeing it as a real tragic part of their history, um, including researchers. I mean, a lot of the research to date has also really focused on the very negative impact, intergenerational trauma. And that is very much part of the story. At the same time, which we're getting to, is again, uh, 7,800 different stories. Um, that it's more nuanced sometimes than uh, the dominant narrative. Um, the other thing I'll mention is Carlisle, because it was so prominent in the public uh, mind, it is symbolic of the entire boarding school system. So people use Carlisle as shorthand for boarding school. And so anything that happened at any boarding school anywhere, and, and Carlisle was probably one of the best to go to because it was one of the best funded schools. It, there were perks compared to going to a school like Shilako, which is in um, Oklahoma and was known for being very poor uh, comparatively. You know, if you live solely on the government um, handout, if you will, what they, what they appropriate for the Bureau of Indian Affairs, many of the schools operated at 
very minimal levels of funding. Um, but Carlisle raised money through ticket sales to football games. So that money was getting turned back to the school. That money was helping to um, renovate buildings and things like that. So there was a slush fund. None of the other schools had that. But Carlisle symbolically is more powerful and to many native communities, you could equate it to Auschwitz. I mean, it really resonates um, that deeply with them because all of the taking children forcibly from communities, which might not have meant they were forcibly taken and brought to Carlisle, but it doesn't matter. They were forcibly taken from their family and taken to a boarding school somewhere. And, um, and that continued well into the mid 20th century, which is another thing um, that there are so many people with living memory of having endured really horrible conditions at many boarding schools as recently as the 1950s and 60s. Yes. I don't think either one of us knows <laughs> that, uh, but interesting question. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about how many people are using the Resource Center? Uh, yes, the, the Resource Center um, right now uh, experiences about 15,000 visits per month. Um, there have been about four and a half million page views uh, since we launched the project in 2013. So it's gotten a lot of attention. Um, and Susan and I get lots of requests from media uh, for interviews uh, across various media outlets to talk about Carlisle and its impact, particularly in light of the um, repatriations that have been taking place the last several years at the school. So um, nearly 200 uh, of the students who died at Carlisle were buried here uh, at the barracks. And uh, finally, there had been uh, one very persistent person, Yufna Soldier Wolf of the Northern Arapaho, kept uh, pressing for a decade to get permission to have the three Northern Arapaho boys who were buried there, to have them return to their homelands in Wyoming. And um, through her persistent effort, um, she finally got them to agree. And in 2017, the first uh, two of the boys were returned. And in 2018, the third, uh, was returned, and there's a documentary that was aired on PBS's Independent Lens series that talks about uh, those repatriations, but there's been 21 altogether now, and there's another eight mm -hmm. scheduled for this month. So families of students who were buried at Carlisle uh, have been uh, submitting their petitions to have remains returned. So that is an ongoing activity that um, utilizes our site, we actually created a cemetery information resource in 2017 um, to make it easier for people to be able to find the records that specifically reference um, the, the death and, and burial of family members at Carlisle. So um, there are efforts. Uh, the Genoa Indian School operated in Nebraska. Um, the University of ne folks at the University of Nebraska Lincoln um, started a project, basically modeled off of ours, um, about five years ago. Um, there is an effort in New Mexico that has taken a different approach, just trying to digitize records that had already been microfilmed within the Bureau of Indian Affairs files, but everything regarding boarding schools in New Mexico for that project. Um, the Stewart Indian School in, in Nevada, they're just starting to talk about doing something like this. Uh, the Mount Pleasant School in Michigan. Um, there's also a National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition that um, was uh, founded about 10 years ago, and so their mission is specifically looking at the issue of, of healing and restorative justice. 
uh, but they are looking to aggregate the information from all of our digital projects so that there will be one place to search and then your search results will take you then to whichever of our digital centers has the information that they're looking for because there are so many questions for people out there about where their family members went. They, they don't know which school necessarily and there were hundreds of them. Um, again, there were just about two dozen off-reservation boarding schools but between the on-reservation boarding schools, the day schools, the religious run um, schools, there are nearly 400 of them all together uh, spread across the country. Uh, Carlisle was closed because it was basically positioned on an army barracks. And the deal was, so the army signed the barracks over to the Department of Interior with the agreement that if the army ever wanted that back, all they had to do was ask. And in July of 1918, they asked. They, they turned uh, the barracks into a convalescent hospital for soldiers returning from World War I. And then after that, they ended up turning it into the medical field school first and operated for several decades uh, as the Army Medical Field School. And then it became the Army War College uh, later on. And part of the reason for that is also while many children died at Carlisle, about 200 again were buried in the cemetery, some were sent home, um, but the Carlisle Indian School actually had a hospital before Carlisle did, had an x-ray, the first x-ray machine. So Pratt was also, you know, very concerned in many ways about the welfare of the children. Um, so they also had good facilities when they were then taking over uh, with, with the soldiers who were recovering from World War I. So again, it's in some ways a, a mixed bag. There are also a number of um, tribes who are wanting to repatriate their children, um, and some who feel as though the remains shouldn't be touched. So the Navajo are likely not to want to uh, repatriate. The Seneca have removed the tombstones that had the Christian cross on it and have installed new tombstones. So there are different uh, responses depending on what particular group you might um, be affiliated with. Um, the other thing I'll mention about closing the school, um, well, there's two things. Number one, there had been an investigation. So um, one of the students at the school had actually gone to his congressperson, uh, Montreville Yuda, who did end up um, staying in Carlisle the rest of his life. Um, he had a number of complaints, and a lot of students had complaints, and so that led to a congressional investigation in 1914. And there's a very lengthy um, government report on everybody's testimony from that, um, everything from mismanagement of finances to not providing enough food and um, in improper um, forms of discipline, things of that nature. And so that's all documented. And so Carlisle had gotten a bit of a black eye already in 1914. Um, and the other thing that was sort of um, happening was more and more people were asking, why are we spending, because again, where, where's the money coming from? There are people in Congress asking, why are we spending all this money to transport these people via train all the way to Carlisle when we've got these other off-reservation boarding schools closer to the native communities? So why are we, the, the ones who are at Cheyenne and Arapahoe Reservation, why aren't they just going to Shalako instead of coming all the way to Carlisle? Um, because there's always people asking, why are we spending this money for this? Because from the government's perspective, they're providing a free education, right? That's, that's all of the tax dollars being spent on the Native Americans. And so they're looking for ways to save a buck as well. So I, when people um, talk about closing Carlisle, I don't think there were a lot of people who were against it. Um, there, there were a few graduates of Carlisle who had written letters saying they were sad to see it close, but uh, for the most part, Carlisle was no longer in its heyday by 1918. Oh yes, okay, so getting back to Wendy's question. Thank you for bringing us back. Okay, 
So yes, um, and this is something we still need to do more research into, but uh, so we knew at the very beginning that there had been cases of faculty members from Dickinson doing um, lectures and demonstrations. We knew specifically um, Charles Francis Himes was a science professor, so he had done uh, science demonstrations for the Indian school. We knew uh, there were several Dickinson faculty members who were also Methodist ministers because of the college's relationship to the Methodist Church at the time. So they were giving um, sermons at the school and doing religious services. Um, we knew of sports competition between the schools, um, so track meets and football games, um, things of that nature. Um, but we've started to see a little, oh, and also some Carlisle Indian School students would attend classes at Dickinson College and at the prep school. Dickinson College had a preparatory school up until 1918. So um, there were a number of Carlisle Indian School students who took classes here as well. Uh, to my knowledge, there was only one student who matriculated at the college who then also received a uh, a bachelor's degree from Dickinson College. Uh, that's Frank Mount Pleasant. He graduated in 1910. Um, but we're starting, as we've been getting more information, we're starting to see some other connections, some deeper connections. Um, there was a faculty member named Joshua Allen Lippincott um, who we knew gave sermons. Um, he also went on recruiting trips. Um, in the early 1880s. And later on, after he left Dickinson, he went to Kansas and was president at uh, one of the Kansas universities and then was very close with the Haskell Indian School there. Um, the president of the college, James Andrew McCauley, uh, he was the one who basically blessed the new chapel at the Carlisle Indian School. That was the first uh, building that they uh, built brand new when the school opened already in the winter of 1879-1880. And um, so he was giving the first service. And Richard Henry Pratt, because he would get charitable donations from, uh, they often say the Quaker ladies in Philadelphia, a lot of, a lot of the um, ladies who supported this effort, um, he needed to create a separate charitable fund to accept those donations because they couldn't go straight to the federal government. So he created uh, basically the Carlisle Indian School Trust and James Andrew McCauley, Dickinson College president, was one of the people asked to serve on the board for that trust. So, um, and I've seen some correspondence that show Macaulay was also going to go on a recruiting expedition uh, sometime in the mid-1880s. So we're starting to see, as, as we gather more information and look more deeply at the records, that there are closer connections between Dickinson and the operations of the Carlisle Boarding School. And the honorary degrees, can you mention that? I mean, yeah. Sure. So uh, Dickinson College also gave an honorary degree to uh, Richard Henry Pratt. Um, I don't remember what year, but um, early in the uh, 20th century. And then another superintendent of the school, Moses Friedman, um, he received an honorary degree, I think in 1914. And Moses Friedman was actually the one who was doing a lot of funny things with the finances, who was seriously reprimanded as a result of that congressional investigation. Um, you know, one example is, as superintendent of the school, he would get reimbursed for expenses. So he would put in a, a, a reimbursement request for um, train travel to attend the football game with the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, but it turned out that his train ticket had been paid for with the athletics slush fund. So he was asking the government to basically re-reimburse him. So he was getting double value. So. Yeah, that's some of the. <laughs> <laughs> so along with the, uh, the land acknowledgement, and we have uh, actually quite a long one and more condensed versions to use at various events. Um, and as part of the Indigeneity Futures Initiative, uh, one of the questions is whether we should revoke the honorary degrees. Um, 
to, to the people who've gotten them. So this is work that's going to continue. We actually talk about it as a living land acknowledgement. It's not just acknowledging what was, um, but where our current relationships are and how we uh, envision the future. So in some ways it's working parallel to the work that Matt Pinsker has also done in terms of Dickinson's relationship to slavery. Um, so this is ongoing work. And is Liz telling us it's time up? <laughs> yes, I think that's why Liz was here. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your engagement and hope you have a great weekend.